Welcome, everybody. The J. Blumler Lecture is an annual opportunity to focus our thoughts upon really big questions, to stretch our moral muscles and to kick a few metaphorical asses. So if universities exist for anything, it's to criticise, to disrupt, 
to envisage how things could be better and different. I can't think of a scholar who embodied those actions more than Jay Blumler. He was quite simply a moral colossus, capable of translating conceptual complexities into the language of everyday civic need. Jay's entire career was devoted to exploring the fragile threads through which politics and democracy hang together and fall apart. This is our first Jay Blumler lecture since Jay died. And many of us will be feeling a, a real sense of loss that that great presence is not there in the front row, ready to come in with questions that we knew were going to be the most penetrating. But I know, because I knew Jay so well, that he would have loved the title of tonight's talk. Why politicians should love journalists, and journalists should never love politicians. And who better to speak to this title than Dorothy Byrne, another great translator, this time between the techno assault upon public consciousness that is television, and the needs of an ever more bemused, disappointed, worried citizenry, desperate for information, almost scavenging for information, but often badly fed. It could only have been Dorothy who had posed the question in her 2019 McTaggart lecture. I quote, what do we do when a known liar becomes our prime minister, unquote? Well, there's an essay question for students in the audience. Uh, 2,000 words, please, with Harvard references at the end. And if you repeat the word Boris more than three times, it means you haven't thought of all the other hollow demagogues who followed in his footsteps. Dorothy was head of... Channel 4 News and Current Affairs for many years. She's a fellow of the Royal Television Society for which she was awarded for outstanding contribution to television, quite rightly. She's received a BAFTA Scotland Award for her service to television. She's also won the Factual Award given by women in film and television. She's a trustee of the Ethical Journalism Network, which supports the development of ethical codes in journalistic organizations across the globe. And she's now president of Murray Edwards College at the University of Cambridge, and they're very lucky to have her. And we're very lucky to have her this evening. So Dorothy, you've got between now and the time that the whistle blows for the Arsenal-Manchester City <laughs> match, when I guarantee this otherwise ardently enthusiastic audience will disappear <laughs> to tell us the answer to your question. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I'd better crack on then. Um, uh, and thank you for the honour of inviting me to give the Jay Blumler Lecture. As you all know, Jay Blumler was one of the first people to take the academic study of the media seriously, establishing the Centre for Television Research and focusing on the relationship between politics and the media. This evening, picking up on that theme, I want to examine the relationship between politicians and the media. What should be the nature of that relationship and what errors must, must both groups avoid? I regret I have bad news for those students among you who aspire to a career in journalism. I'm sure that on a personal level, you really love some politicians 
when you see one on TV speaking frankly and openly, as they always do, I bet you think to yourself, I'd like to know them better. And if you were in any other walk of life, maybe the gambling industry or working for a Russian oligarch, politicians might be your go-to people for friendship. But I'm sorry, if you become a journalist, they can never be your friends because journalists should never love politicians. That means that you'll miss out on chumming up with some really great people, but so be it. Brace yourself because I'm going to show you just a fabulous few of those you can never befriend. <laughs> yes, it's Dominic Raab, or as civil servants used to call him, Mr. Nice Guy, the sort of boss who says at the end of the day, hey, you've all worked so hard, fancy a jar, down the spitting feathers, First round's on me, and the second, just to say a big thank you for all your efforts. But sorry, Dominic can't be your friend. Jacob Rees-Mogg. He's such a thoughtful boss that he used to leave little notes on civil servants' desks when they were working from home, saying, sorry you were out when I visited. That's so sweet. He missed them that much. Some claim these notes were crass and demeaning to people working perfectly legally from their kitchen tables. But you just need to look at Jacob to know he would never patronize anyone. But I'm sorry, he can't be your friend either. Then there's Liz Truss. Maybe some of you are finding it hard to manage on a student's modest budget and want ideas on how to live within your means. She'd be your obvious port of call. And indeed, based on her brilliant record in office, Liz now pops up all over the world dispensing her words of wisdom on how nations should manage their finances. But sorry, You'll just have to work out your budget for yourself because she can't be your friend. And finally, everyone's favorite politician, Boris Johnson. You know how sometimes you need a friend to tell you the naked truth? Boris would be your man, at least for the naked bit. Not so sure about the truth. But I regret he is also off limits because journalists should never try to be the friend of politicians. No good can come of it. We should always respect politicians because they were elected by the people, and many of them work selflessly for the public good, putting their own private interests aside, never thinking for a moment of how they personally could benefit from office or at least some of them do, or so I've been told. But we need to keep them at arm's length. Sometimes it's tempting to curry favor with a politician to get an exclusive, but you should never be left feeling that they will expect something in return. You can like them secretly if you want. You can even pretend to like them when in fact you think they are utterly venal and vile. Obviously, I've never done that. I think it's inevitable that if you get too close to a politician, there's a danger you can't report on them without fear or favor. So you can be friendly, but never friends. And you should certainly never try to please politicians. That leads down the path to perdition. We are not there to make politicians happy. We are there to tell the truth and thereby almost certainly make them extremely unhappy at times. From time to time, one hears BBC apparatchiks contorting themselves, even abasing themselves, to prove to critical politicians 
that they are not a bunch of limpid liberal lefties. I find it excruciating. Stand by your journalism. Don't abase yourself. The politicians who launch horrible and unfair attacks on public service broadcasters are playing a game of their own, one I will examine in a few minutes. By being defensive, you play into their hands and you also give the public the impression that you are guilty as charged. Sometimes in their desperate bid to prove to politicians they are impartial, the BBC loses something just as vital to good broadcast journalism as fairness and accuracy, proportionality. That's what happened with the BBC's own coverage of the Gary Lineker story after he tweeted criticism of government plans to stop migrant boats crossing the channel, going on to liken their language to that used by the German government in the 1930s. That was certainly a story, but should it really have led BBC news bulletins? Stories should be given only the attention they deserve. The BBC, I suspect, in its fear of looking anti-government, let the public down by giving that story excessive coverage, both in terms of prominence and amount. They thereby ended up helping to create it as a huge story and not being duly impartial about the story itself. Every time I turned on Radio 4, there was the Lineker story. I hardly dared turn on Gardner's question time for fear they'd be asking, what mulch would Gary Lineker use on his rhododendrons and would it be lefty liberal mulch? At one point during the Lineker row, I wondered, has the war in Ukraine ended without me knowing? Because all I seem to hear about on the BBC is a football pundit's tweet. I quite often myself appear on the BBC talking about media matters. On the Lineker story, I received several requests to do so, including from the Today programme and Newsnight. Some of these requests took the form of increasingly desperate texts begging me to come on. To each request, I said the same thing. I would happily come on to decry the way the BBC was being manipulated by PR machines using Gary Gay to distract attention from the real issue, which was whether the government's policy on refugees was moral, legal, or viable. But I would not contribute to the confabulated crisis in the BBC's reputation for impartiality. I said I understood why the Gary Lineker story should be on the front page of the right-wing press, along with Harry and Meghan, but why was the BBC doing the same? When I said that was the only view I would give, they didn't want me. My voice was denied. How impartial was that? The story grew bigger, of course, when other football pundits refused to do match coverage. Everyone was talking about it. But as we all know, it's a truism. What's interesting to the public isn't the same as what's in the public interest. There is no way that BBC outlets would have devoted such huge coverage to the Lineker story if it had not involved the BBC itself. Gary Lineker is not a politician or a political journalist. He's a freelance sports commentator. The story did not merit the coverage given it to, to it by the BBC. Their excessive coverage fueled, fueled the fake crisis in their journalism and signaled to me their fears of politicians' disapprobation. Now, they're having an investigation and report. 
into the Lineker debacle, as they so often do. Former TV executives get paid tens of thousands of pounds to write such reviews for the BBC. It would be a great gig if it didn't involve talking to lots of worried BBC journalists and making them even more worried. The results of another BBC review were recently reviewed. This one was into BBC economics coverage. <clears throat> it was prompted, as so often, by a public letter of critical complaints. I've no idea what its excellent authors were paid. The finding which gained most attention was that too many journalists lack understanding of basic economics. However, the authors admitted that their critiques could ap apply at least as equally to other UK media. As it happens, I know a couple of other people it could also apply to. Quasi Quarteng, former Chancellor of the Exchequer, and Liz again. I would personally have preferred a BBC investigation into their lack of economic understanding. I'm not saying that reviews and investigations are bad things. All good public service organisations should examine themselves and be transparent about what they find. And it's legitimate for politicians to put pressure on public service organisations. For example, politicians have rightly complained that journalists come from far too narrow a background. Funnily enough, they often come from a very similar narrow background to that of another group, politicians. An extraordinary number of both professions studied politics, philosophy, and economics at Oxford. Politicians, Rishi Sunak, Liz Truss, David Cameron, Jeremy Hunt, journalists, Nick Robinson, Christian Gurumurthy, Robert Peston, David Dimbleby, to name just a few. If so many politicians who messed up the economy studied economics at Oxford, and if that BBC review is right, and many journalists also lack basic understanding of economics, yet lots of them also studied economics at Oxford, it makes you wonder about that course. And it would probably have been better if they had all gone to Leeds University. <laughs> Rightly pressured by politicians, the BBC has recently set itself a target of ensuring that 25% of staff should come from lower socio-economic groups by 2027. Currently, 20% of BBC staff come from such backgrounds. A disturbing piece of research last week from the Reuters Institute Trust in News Project found that individuals from marginalised communities saw news media as biased against them. They often viewed the media as an extension of systems aligned to serve those in power. Many saw journalists as out of touch and lacking lived experience. Those interviewed said that for news organisations to increase trust in them, journalists needed to pay better attention to marginalised communities' concerns. We need to pay heed to views like that, and media organisations must become more representative of the UK population. But maybe journalists should be putting pressure on MPs to do the same. Just 7% of all MPs can be considered working class, and just 1% of Conservative MPs, according to analysis by the Institute for Public Policy Research last July. 
and they said that the proportion of working class labor MPs has halved since the 1980s. Where politicians have definitely got it right is in their drive for the BBC and Channel 4 to move more journalists to the north of England. I am delighted that Channel 4 News, News Studio, opens in Leeds next week. And the Leeds News team have been given a mandate to focus in particular on investigations, social affairs, and data journalism. Since Channel 4 opened its headquarters in Leeds, a number of terrific current affairs programs have also been commissioned out of the city. I especially recommend to you the undercover programme about the current state of England's ambulance services. Programmes made out of the north of England give a perspective on the UK which is insufficiently reflected on television and radio. Jay Blumler was appointed the Granada Television Research Fellow at Leeds University in 1963. And I worked for more than a decade at Granada TV in Manchester, much of it on World in Action. I believe World in Action was the best current affairs television programme ever broadcast in this country. And a key reason for its success was that Granada was based in the north of England. One day, I would love to see the main base of Channel 4 and Channel 4 News shifted to Leeds, with London a regional office like others in Glasgow and Bristol. The north of England needs a public service television channel based in the region. I am sure that many northern MPs would agree with that, and I believe they would be right to press the government for an even greater shift of BBC and Channel 4 resources to the north. Politicians' involvement in discussions about public broadcasters' performance and future is not just right, it's essential. They are the representatives of the people and broadcasters must be accountable to the people. Of course, politicians have always tried to interfere in journalism itself and launched furious tirades. Alistair Campbell was notorious for ringing up BBC executives before, during and after news programmes. People have asked me if that used to happen to me when I was head of news and current affairs at Channel 4. I never gave him my phone number. Of course, when politicians are weak, they look for others to blame for their troubles. And BBC journalists are always good scapegoats. I was amused to read at the weekend a big headline in the Mail on Sunday. The BBC put me on trial for six months. It's been tough on my family but my wife's a rock star. At first, I was confused when I read the first line of the headline. A man with family troubles, whose wife is a rock star, has been hounded by the BBC. Who could it be? Well, of course, it turns out it was none other than the bloke I told you could never be your friend. Dominic Raab again. But I was befuddled. As far as I had been aware, Dominic Raab had said he would resign if an inquiry found he had bullied civil servants. And it did, so he did. That story was covered in every media outlet, not just on the BBC. I was still confused until I came to the key quote. The BBC has spent the last six months getting one or two sources who are breaching the civil service code of conduct and breaching the rules of the inquiry. From the public's point of view, you are going to get totally skewed news if that's what you do. Hmm. Oh, Dominic, 
thank you so much for worrying about us, the public, being duped by skewed media. But you didn't need to bother your big head because we got our news about your ghastly behavior from balanced and fair reports, not just on the BBC, but across all news broadcast and written. This was a ridiculous example of a politician using the media to deflect criticism from its own shortcomings. It's commonplace. On the Today programme, when Michael Gove is on the ropes in an interview, he often starts deflecting criticisms from, of his policies by blaming something he calls the media. Just saying a name weirdly, and it, you make it sound bad, don't you? For example, I could call him Michael go ho 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 Politicians have always laid into public service broadcasters, but when Boris Johnson became prime minister, something very different began to happen. A relentless attempt to undermine the very existence of public service broadcasting in this country. It was sinister and it is dangerous. Broadcasters in the UK play a vital role in our democracy. Until recently, there was a cross-party consensus about its value. But more recently, politicians have been undermining the financial models on which public service broadcasting depends, and thereby, in my view, undermining the fabric of our democracy. Let's examine the attempts to privatize Channel 4, the new headquarters of which are so near us now. Privatization would have been an act of madness and made no financial sense. Channel 4 is owned by the public and doesn't cost it a penny. Indeed, because Channel 4 earns almost all its income from advertising, when I worked there, I found that most members of the public didn't even know they owned it. The key argument put forward for privatization by the then culture secretary, Nadine Doris, was that Channel 4's financial model was unsustainable. But it emerged when Doris gave evidence to a parliamentary committee that she had mistakenly believed Channel 4 relied on taxpayer funding when it earns its revenues through advertising and other commercial enterprises. In other words, she didn't even know what its financial model was when she said that financial model was broken. Her ignorance proves that the proposal to privatize was purely political. Privatization would certainly have reduced democratic debate and the diversity of ideas broadcast in this country. It would also have reduced competition, something Tories are supposed to be big supporters of. Channel 4 provides one hour of high quality news a night, often providing different perspectives to those you see on the BBC. Its current affairs is multi-award winning, especially for its international documentaries its great track record in investigative journalism, breaking major stories like Cambridge Analytica and making films like the Oscar nominated for Sama, has added significantly to the quality and range of journalism in this country. If Channel 4 had been privatized, any commercial buyer would soon have been looking for ways to cut back on news costs and to move the news out of its prime time slot. A commercial owner would inevitably have wanted to cut back on expensive and hard-hitting current affairs investigation. Channel 4 has been saved from privatization and can now look forward to an exciting future. But the attacks on the BBC have been even more relentless and its funding future is still perilous. The BBC's budgets have been cut, and it has announced it has to find annual savings 
of 400 million pounds by 2027-28. And its current model, the license fee, is set to go in 2027. The manner of the announcement of this news tells us everything about how well considered it was. Nadine Doris announced it on Twitter late at night. She said, the license fee announcement will be the last. The Sunday Times later suggested that the announcement was part of so-called Operation Red Meat, an attempt to draw attention away from Partygate scandals and to please right-wing Tories. Doris also assured us we are ready to implement a new way of funding. I think that brilliant new BBC funding model must be lying in a cupboard somewhere along with Boris Johnson's oven-ready Brexit deal. Because to date, there has been no well-considered alternative to the BBC unveiled. I'm not against getting rid of the BBC licence fee. It is a strange thing, so long as you have a viable and better replacement. Meanwhile, Doris also promised that she would create a new golden age of British TV. And there she has been true to her word. It's called Friday Night with Nadine on Talk TV, and her first guest was Boris Johnson. So the secure financial future of our most significant public service broadcaster is in doubt. That has implications for the democratic life of our country. I have many criticisms of the BBC, but it is what fundamentally one of the most successful organisations in this country. For a start, it's massively used and it's also massively trusted, which is why it's so important to our democracy, and we saw that in COVID. The regulator, Ofcom, does a survey of UK news consumption each year. The last report came out in July 2022. It found that 76% of the public use BBC news services across all platforms, making it by far the most popular source of news in the country. 74% of those who watched it said BBC News was accurate, and 73% said that it was trustworthy. Please don't believe people when they say nobody watches or trusts mainstream media news anymore. That's one of the big lies we must reject. Let's compare those high levels of trust to the public's low trust in politicians. In the last census in 2021, just a fifth of, politician of the population said that they trusted political parties. Only 35% of the population said they trusted national government. And by the way, Dominic Raab, you may have a low view of civil servants, but they rated a lot higher than politicians, with 55% of people saying they trusted them. And just to remind you, all that is significantly below the 73% of regular BBC viewers who say it's trustworthy. That census was in 2021. In November last year, a survey of 1,700 people by YouGov for IPPR found that 66% of people believed politicians were only out for themselves and only 4% said they believed politicians were doing the best for the country. And the public's view of politicians appears to be falling still further. The annual Edelman Trust Barometer, which surveys 3,000 UK adults and was published in late February this year, found trust in government had fallen from 35% in the 2021 census 
to 27%. But I thought the most extraordinary result in that Edelman survey was that 77% of people said politicians made things worse. That's sort of an achievement. I am genuinely concerned that if the public's trust in politicians falls too low, they will cease to believe in democracy itself. Of course, one of the best ways that politicians could restore, to restore trust in themselves would be to appear regularly on radio and television in full-length, in-depth interviews of the sort which used to appear weekly in the UK. And that is my key point today. Politicians may think we are just a bunch of troublemakers, always looking to secretly film them and trick them, never giving them credit when they deserve it, failing to understand how difficult policy is. But journalists are essential for democracy. Without good journalism, democracy can't survive. And that's why, whatever politicians think of journalists, they have to love us, not as individuals, but love journalism. And let's finally look at what happens when the relationship between politicians and journalists goes wrong and the dire effects that can have on democracy. And here, I would like us to pause for a moment to give some sympathy to an old man who just had a major relationship in his life go horribly wrong to great public humiliation. Poor Rupert Murdoch. I think you all know the relationship that I'm talking about. His friendship with Donald Trump. Rupert and Donald, the end of the affair. But as with so many doomed romances, Rupert should never have got into bed with Donald in the first place. We are told that following Trump's election as president, Murdoch used to ring him at least once a week. Murdoch also had weekly conversations with Trump's son-in-law and senior advisor, Jared Kushner. According to the New York Times, Trump counted Murdoch as one of his closest confidants. Murdoch publicly called Trump a friend. Get ready for a shocking picture. Two of my favorite men hugging. It's great to see genuine male bonding, isn't it? Because you know they really loved each other and it wasn't just a relationship of convenience for each of them. But wow, has that relationship gone wrong? And of course it went wrong because it was never appropriate. Last week, Fox News agreed to pay $787 million to Dominion Voting Systems. The payout is the largest publicly known definition settlement involving a media company in US history. 20 broadcasts by Fox News had com contained completely untrue assertions that Dominion rigged the presidential elections. Fox says it now acknowledges the court's ruling finding certain claims about Dominion to be false. The words of the lawyer for Dominion, Justin Nelson, are worth noting. He said, for our democracy to endure for another 250 years, and hopefully much longer, we must share a commitment to facts. Today represents a ringing endorsement for truth and for democracy. Damning emails and texts, as well as deposition statements made public, revealed that key figures within Fox, including Rupert Murdoch, his CEO son, Lachlan Murdoch, and top Fox host, said privately that the vote rigging claims by Trump were ludicrous. According to the evidence, Rupert Murdoch himself thought that the denial of Biden's victory was, to quote, 
really crazy. Um, and others in the corporation said that privately that um, what they were putting on air was cookie, dangerously reckless, and mind-blowingly nuts. Fox has avoided a damaging trial with even worse headlines that would have come. It won't have to broadcast any statement on air as it would have done in Britain. And hilariously, they even put out a statement saying, this settlement reflects Fox's continued commitment to the highest journalistic standards. Despite paying out nearly $800 million, Fox News say the case was a meritless assault on First Amendment press freedoms. They are still, as you will know, facing a second huge lawsuit from Smartmatic, another voting technology company that says it was smeared. Of course, the US system does not contain the protections we have in the UK, which help to guarantee the separation of politicians and journalists. Our regulations would never have permitted presenters to state as facts spurious allegations of one politician. And of course, Fox News didn't spout nonsense because they loved Donald Trump. The internal correspondence makes clear that their fear was that Trump's supporting viewers would desert them. One executive wrote to another that if Biden was declared winner, we're going to get hit very hard. Here in the UK, commercial broadcasters like ITV are bound by the same regulations as public service organizations like Channel 4. They could not have bent the rules about the result of a general election just to hold on to viewers. US broadcasters also used to have to represent opinions fairly and accurately, but the fairness doctrine, as it was called, was abolished under pressure from the right, allegedly because it hurt the public interest and violated free speech rights. So why should we here worry about events in the, UK, in the US which could not happen here? I talk about this case because while it could not happen here now, that is not to say it could never happen in the future. Just as there used to be a political consensus that public service broadcasting was a good thing, there was also a consensus that the system of regulation was a good thing. I should state that Ofcom, the regulator, has found both in favor of and against programs I have commissioned myself. My view is that it works well, but it has been increasingly criticized in very recent years and its independence threatened. Boris Johnson's attempt to put mail editor Paul Dacre into Ofcom as chair was really chilling. And there has also been questioning of the idea that we need regulation at all. Here's just one headline from the critic. Ofcom is a menace to our freedom of speech. It is high time we liberated our airways. The writer, Professor Andrew Tenenbaum, argues that television and radio should be subject only to such controls as the general law of libel, privacy, and, uh, 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 and against criminality. The choice should lie with us and not with any government office, however well-intentioned. In theory, that is a strong argument, but look at what happened in the US. Terrible lies were disseminated on television inflaming violent professors. And years later, Fox News had to pay out a huge sum in damages. Regulation would have prevented the damage in the first place because journalists would have known they would not have been able to get away with it. The idea of using libel laws later 
to protect our democracy is ludicrous. In the few hours that protesters stormed Capitol Hill, galvanized by Donald Trump's words, a democracy which seems so secure was suddenly under threat. And journalists who acted as the mouthpieces for Trump's dangerous lies contributed to that threat. They crossed the no man's land which should always divide journalists from politicians. So let that be a warning to us all. Journalists don't get close to politicians, however much you want to. And politicians respect the fact that we will criticize you and for the sake of democracy, love us for it. Thank you. very much, uh, Dorothy. It was uh, provocative, it was challenging, um, and there are going to be lots of questions. And uh, who wants to go first? Uh, and I'm going to give priority to students, where I see people who look like students, and of course everyone to me looks like a student now. <laughs> but if, um, uh, but, 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 but don't, don't hold back. Right at the back. Is there a mic? Just wait for the mic, and if you want to tell us who you are, you can, but if you don't, we'll guess. We shouldn't guess who people are based on their appearance. Okay, tell us who you are. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Charlie, uh, second year PPE student. I just had a quick question regarding um, how you'd recommend, outside of just a good faith principle, you prevent politicians from doing what is in their best interest, namely just basically denying any speech that goes against a narrative they would wish to set up. How, what, how would you recommend, at least especially in the UK context, preventing politicians from just going, oh yes, all this media that's against me is trash and in, ensuring that the media is free enough to be able to investigate and challenge uh, politics, especially in the interests of the public? Well, that's a very important question. I think the first thing that we have to do when politicians make complaints is we have to say to them, we have a system of regulation, make a formal complaint to the regulator. Because what you find with these politicians is that they'll make often a very generalized complaint, but they won't make it to the regulator because they know most of the time, <laughs> that it's without foundation and that the complaint will not be upheld. And that's one reason that I'm against a thing that quite a few broadcasters do, which is have meetings with people who complain about them. At Channel 4, I very, very rarely met anybody. If people said they had a complaint, I said, send it to me in writing. If you're not satisfied with my response, then make a complaint to the regulator. But I don't think that we should start engaging in um, you know, general uh, fighting in the media. And I think that, um, as I said in my talk, that where journalists are attacked by politicians, they should very clearly defend their journalism and not try to um, appease the politician in some way. It just, it, uh, and if they're wrong, they should of course say it, but uh, you, you've, you've got to be strong in standing up for your journalism. Thank you, Dorothy. Next question. Uh, in the third row there. Hi, I'm Lorna Sorensen. I lecture in uh, political communication here at Leeds. Um, so I think you drew up some very helpful, clear principles and dividing journalists and politicians. And I was wondering about your thoughts of uh, 
trend towards those lines becoming more blurred um, in cases like um, GB News, for example, where you have politicians who have become anchors, supposed anchors, with the format and the style suggests that they take on that role. And you mentioned Nadine Doris as well. Um, I mean, I can Im imagine what you think about it, but also um, what are the implications of this and, and how should it be dealt with? Well, actually, I would rather see G um, Nadine Doris on GB News than running the country. Um, or talk news, I think she's on, actually, isn't it? Um, is that right? Um, because I, I don't think that she was a good culture secretary. And she may well be fine and entertaining as a presenter. And at least there's a transparency to it, isn't there? Unlike secret lobbying that goes on, you can actually see her, she's on TV, she's overtly a conservative. You have not got the same expectations of her as you would have of Krishna and Guru Murthy or Hugh Edwards, but at least it, it's open. And I, honestly, I, I can think of quite a number of conservatives who I would rather see dumped on an obscure television channel than running Britain. But it is interesting because, um, you know, technically, if she's going to be claiming that this is in some way a, a proper news or current affairs programme, she should be duly impartial. But I'm, I, that doesn't worry me. It's secret things that worry me. Great. Um, more questions. I'm happy to take one or two um, together. So I'm going to take one from the gentleman there, and then there's a lady in front. My name is Timothy, and I'm uh, doing an MA in communication and media. Uh, Noam Chomsky recently claimed that the UK media ganged up against Jeremy Corbyn and cost him an election. In that particular case, shouldn't the media have been friendlier towards that particular politician? Thank you. Great question. We'll take the one in front as well. Uh, hi, I'm Kate, Kate Watkins, and I teach the dark arts of journalism to students. Um, my, my question is really about what you were talking about with trust in journalists. Um, and you, you talked about wanting longer form interviews, but isn't half of the problem or part of the problem that, that, that we are increasingly having shorter form journalism and that um, political journalists are more likely to be under pressure to tweet or TikTok than they are to sit down and do a really good, long, uh, uh, big interview with, a, with politicians? Well, dealing with that question first, I don't mind journalists tweeting things briefly. I think that's fine. It, it gives you an update about the news, so long as it's fair. Often I receive a tweet, and it points me to a website to read more. I think that is OK. But I think where you're absolutely right is that 20 years ago, we had in-depth, long-form grilling of our leading politicians on television. Political journalists still want to do that. Uh, and I always remember that Kenneth Clark said that when he was in Margaret Thatcher's cabinet, they were just told it was expected. You had to go out and do big, really difficult interviews with somebody like Robin Day, or a bit after him, Jeremy Paxman. Margaret Thatcher always put herself up for big interviews. And I think it is appalling now that uh, politicians will not put themselves up for long, tough interviews where we can really examine things. Now, of course, the person who really wouldn't put himself up for major interviews was Jeremy Corbyn. So it's easy for Jeremy Corbyn, you could say, to say, well, I don't go onto television to be asked difficult questions by Andrew Neil, because 
Andrew Neil is too prejudiced against me to do it. I do not agree with that way of seeing things. If you are going to stand to be the prime minister of this country and television is the most used uh, source of news in this country, you cannot refuse to be on it. You just can't. And Jeremy Corbyn actually got his message out really well in many ways on social media, but in the end, people didn't vote for him. And there are people here, like his nibs, who can tell you why they didn't vote for him, because they didn't like his policies. People knew what Jeremy Corbyn stood for, and they didn't want it. And that is just a fact. And I, I'm not saying that British television is perfect, but it is not true that it's um, absolutely prejudiced and all the things that some commentators say. That, that, that literally doesn't stand up. What I think my criticism would be, would be the opposite. It's attempt to be falsely impartial. And the, and the worst example of that that we have seen is in coverage of Brexit, where there was absolute fake impartiality on BBC News. And I, I didn't go into that because I knew you all, I know you all know about that, that where the vast majority of economists said that Brexit would not be a good idea. BBC journalists were told to keep trying to find people to balance it up. And so the British people were not given a, a, a proper picture of where expert advice lay. They might, might not have agreed with um, that economists really are experts because they don't have that great uh, track record and being right about the economy. But I, I, I think it's the opposite problem that we have seen in Britain. And that if there had been better coverage of Brexit, there could have been a different outcome, whether that was good or bad. Thank you. I should just say, incidentally, that Jeremy Corbyn was interviewed by Andrew Neil during the 2019 election, just as a yes. matter of record. I take your point about um, the rest of what you're saying. I was giving it as a uh, general uh, example. No, I know. I know. I accept. Um, further questions. I want to encourage people who, you know, if you don't agree with what uh, Dorothy was saying... I don't um, agree with uh, some of what I say. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, yeah, go I'm ahead. I'm sorry. You're... Yeah. There, second row. Hi, my name's Lucy, I'm a PhD student. Um, I wondered if, uh, if you could give some of your feedback from a media industry perspective, just going back to what you said at the beginning about um, sort of good journalists, in quote marks, <laughs> um, especially coming from marginalized, marginalized backgrounds or from working class backgrounds, and how they can get to those top positions of editor or even proprietor. How can they get to those top positions because um, sort of what you correctly identified, the um, jostling between sort of editors and politicians being in the same sort of Oxbridge spaces and the very privileged or sort of elite spaces. How can journalists come up to disrupt I th that? I think it's about getting a lot of people in who do not come from those backgrounds. So if I look at the situation for women, when I entered television, it never struck me that I could ever be a boss. There were no women bosses. When I first worked on World in Action, I was at that point the only woman. So I couldn't have ambition and plus, we regularly got assaulted by the male bosses, which definitely helped to put us in our place, didn't it? But now, I was the head of news and current affairs, and the new head of news and current affairs at Channel 4 is a woman. Um, the head of news at the BBC is a woman. Her predecessor was a woman. The editor of Channel 4 News is a woman. 
the head of ITN as a woman. So I think I see what's happened with women as pointing us to the way forward, that you, we need to get uh, more people in from a more diverse background. And I think all of the broadcasters are aware of that. They're all trying to do it. Whether they're doing it well or not, you can judge. I think you need to give them, uh, I, I think we all need to give them ideas of how to do it. I worked in investigative journalism, which was not only male and posh, it was overwhelmingly men who had gone to Oxford and Cambridge and um, who had gone to private schools. Uh, there was this particular thing as well, if they went to Westminster and then they went to Oxford, it was, it was overwhelming. So I do think we have to start in the education system. One reason I have gone to Cambridge is to try to change Cambridge. Let's start there. But also, when I was at Channel 4, I set up a Master's in Investigative Journalism at De Montfort University because it has such a diverse um, background of the students who go there deliberately to try to get people uh, from very different backgrounds into investigative journalism. Because until you get sufficient numbers, they won't start rising to the top and getting top jobs. I mean, ironically, in the past, lots in newspapers, lots of people, men, I should say, not people, entered journalism through local papers. I entered through local papers. Lots of them had left school at 16, maximum 18, didn't have degrees, working class. I mean, the media has gone backwards in that sense. That's really interesting. OK, we're going to take two, two, two at a time. There's somebody right at the back, second to last row, and, uh, and, and, and then down there. Yeah. That's it. My name is Nancy, um, a PhD student uh, from the School of Media and Communication. Uh, you stated that um, what is interesting to the public isn't necessarily what is of interest to the public. Do you think um, that is the main source of tension between the politicians and journalists? And do you think the two groups can ever get a common ground as far as that is concerned? Just take this one as well, just down here. I'm Chris Patterson. I teach here uh, as well. Um, my question for you is, is uh, to get your opinion of the other side of the picture, the political sphere that, that you've been witness to for so long. Um, television is part of creating really quite a harsh and hostile environment for those who rise to the top of British politics, and, and you've just declared we're not going to be their friends. So I'm just putting to you, what are the prospects for um, people who are authentic and diverse and all the things we, we might want in national leaders? What are their prospects for surviving the system that's, that exists for them at the, at the top of the political world? You know, will, you know, can those people yeah. Rise to the fore. And um, I think uh, it's very concerning that so many young people say that they wouldn't want to be politicians. But the reason they don't want to be politicians isn't to do with good journalism exposing really bad things that politicians are doing. That is not what's putting them off. What's putting them off is horrible attacks on, the social, me on social media, particularly against women. You know, 
if, I, if my daughter suddenly said she wanted to be an MP, I would be really worried. I'd actually be worried about her personal safety as well. So I think it's that level of attack. And I also think that the, the savaging that goes on against some politicians when the, you know, when the tabloids really move in against them is again horrible. But it, it's not good journalism that's putting people off. You know, the Blackpool MP, who was just secretly filmed by uh, the Times, he will be very unhappy at the moment, and he should be very unhappy because he was secretly filmed, potentially offering to help members of the gambling industry in return for money. So I, I don't think that that is the issue. I think with um, turning to what's interesting to the public and what's in the public interest, well, what you see again and again is politicians trying to deflect attention from really serious policy issues, um, both by attacking the journalists asking the question, which is wrong, or by beginning to talk about something that is really irrelevant. And, you know, again and again, I, I, I don't think that Radio 4 is necessarily the Today programme in its absolutely best place at the moment, but I did hear um, Nick Robinson, I think it was this morning, um, asking Suella Braverman a question that was a perfectly legitimate question and she just refused to answer it. So he asked the question three times, and it did begin to sound a bit rude. But on the other hand, she had made no, no attempt to answer it. And what I've noticed politicians do on the radio is they get asked a question, and then they answer a completely different anodyne question that they weren't asked, and then when the, polit the journalist tries to interrupt and say, could you answer my question, they go like this, don't interrupt me, let me speak, as if the, suddenly the journalist is the person in the wrong. Uh, so I think we have to keep saying the same thing to politicians, which is, if you deny our right to question you, and investigate you, the public will never trust you. If you are perceived not to be answering questions, why, why would I trust you? And I know it's difficult to answer a question truthfully. I'm not expecting that politicians will tell me the whole truth, but they could just tell me a bit of it. But I think we need to keep going on at them. That's great. Um, Let's take two or three quick questions. Um, there's one at the back. Who else? Uh, come on, don't resist uh, asking the questions you might have wanted to ask. There's one there, and there's one over there. So we're going we're gonna to we're gonna take three questions and... Hi, hello. Ooh. Yeah, um, so uh, Abdullah Abbasin, second year law student. Um, so I just had a question, and it's kind of in the context of um, global news and kind of what's going on in Sudan now especially. So I just wanted to ask how do you think is the best way, because obviously you've highlighted that there's this kind of relationship between the journalists and the politicians and the kind of, I guess you could call it animosity between them. So how do you think is the best way for us as students, as citizens, as like a Sudanese national to get in contact with reporters to be able to see kind of opinions and the spreading and awareness from people in higher positions, such as Rishi Sunak, or such as people in heads of states. So how can we use reporters as an outlet to be able to spread kind of the things that we care about? Well, I would say if you had interesting ideas for th um, subjects which should be examined, certainly when I was at Channel 4 and on Channel 4 News, we loved getting ideas in, especially from young people, who might know things that we didn't know. 
um, we uh, I always did our best not to say the only people who have good questions to ask are the people who have been doing journalism for 20 years. You know, um, really young, informed people with different perspectives. Certainly at Channel 4, we were desperate for that. And the BBC should be desperate for it. And has started having more young and diverse people on TV. OK, we'll take that one next. But come and talk also to, to some of us afterwards about specific ways that you can make those contacts if that's what you wish to do. OK. All right, this one next. I'm Bethany Klein. I'm a professor of media and communication. I wanted to pick up the question about encouraging more people from marginalized backgrounds into um, the news and media industries. Um, my sense is that, a, well, not so much my sense, my understanding is that a lot of the research about people from marginalized backgrounds um, rising in the ranks uh, suggests that in order to do that, you kind of have to play by the rules. So for women, this means like being one of the boys. For people from marginalized backgrounds in terms of race and ethnicity, this means like not making people uncomfortable with your crazy ideas about difference. Um, and I, I suppose uh, we, have, we have people here who study that, and I think it, you know, it's both really interesting and super depressing to hear those re results. I would love to hear from you as a woman who's been in quite powerful positions and who knows other women in quite powerful positions in news whether it makes a difference that they're women. And if it doesn't make a difference that they're women, then what's the point of getting those people into those positions? You know, what is it that we're hoping to achieve? Well, it, it makes a huge difference. And the way things are now bears no relation to what it was like when I entered television 40 years ago. The fact that there are women in senior positions who take time off to go and have babies who talk about the menopause, who talk about looking after their elderly relatives. I, I mean, that never happened before. The whole thing of the culture of working, you know, as late at night as possible and never seeing your children, gone. Um, when I first went to Channel 4, my then boss, a man, I said to him, you keep booking, I was editing dispatches, uh, you, you keep booking me to have meetings which begin at five o'clock and then they run over and I have to see my daughter, I was a single par parent, and he said, I've worked at Channel 4 for 14 years and in that time I have hardly ever seen my children. And I said, well, I think that's awful. And I then went to his secretary and said, you are not to book me to have any meeting that starts after three o'clock, because I know these blokes will go on. So it's completely different. The fact that we face relentless assault, that uh, there is still some of that, but it's, it's very different now. But a lot of that is in the power of our numbers. Now, for the Ethical Journalism Network, um, I, I just helped um, get money from the Roundtree Trust for money for some research that's just been published. I don't know if you've seen it, about what it's like for young people from ethnic minorities, particularly black people, in British newsrooms. And w one reason <clears throat> that we, we got that money from Roundtree was that all the bosses of newses were trying to find out why was it that young black people left. And we said, well, we are a network of journalists, um, and therefore we're journalists who speak to journalists. So um, we did that research, which I, I, I won't go into it all now, but I think it was very important research about people not feeling comfortable. One of the things that people talked about is being sent on stories about black people because you're black. And also, in, if you were sent to cover Black Lives Matter, 
that it never seemed to strike anybody, that that would be really personally upsetting for you. So one of the things that we introduced when I was at Channel 4, for example, is that if you were going to make a major documentary about rape, we didn't wait for you to feel upset afterwards. We got the idea, you're going to need help and counselling before you start. You're going to need to learn some techniques of how to distance yourself from the distress of people you're reporting, that sort of thing. So I think we've advanced a lot with women and we're way behind with other things uh, and other individual groups. And I think we should look at some of the successes that women have brought about and go, well, what can they teach us? But ultimately, it's about numbers. Uh, and when you get sufficient numbers, then you start getting bosses. Thank you. It was great. OK, thanks very much. Um, Right over there. Yeah, I just wondered if you think that the kind of volume and accessibility of news in today's world is actually beneficial to a society and individuals? Well, I think you have to start with reality. We've got that volume of news and we're not going to be able to switch it off. And I think in many ways it's terrific because in the past there was BBC and ITV and they were all posh white men and they told me what to think. And they generally, did, they told me the news but they didn't tell me how they got it. I just had to believe them, I had no choice, I had no idea. Whereas now I'm being bombarded by all sorts of people. And you never know, Nadine Doris may have some good points to make. But also, um, if I hear something, I heard a, a, a report on the radio yesterday that I thought, I just don't believe this. They had some expert on. I, I, and you know, you can go into Google now and then I, you can ask around other people. And I, I did, I found out I was right. That person was talking absolute rubbish and should never have been on. So I, I think it's, it's overwhelming, um, but it's great. So long as it's real diversity and, and not just lots of the same news. And obviously, how do I tell apart truth and lies is a whole other subject? Dorothy, it's been uh, a great talk that you've given us. You can see from the questions that uh, you've got people thinking, you've got people asking questions. For me, the, the line I'm going to take away from your talk is you never know. Nadine Mor Norris might have something useful to say. <laughs> um, and... Uh, I don't sleep well at night, so uh, that's going to add to my problems. Well, this has been great. Um, those of you who've been at previous Jay Blumler lectures will know that Jay would normally come up not only to thank the speaker, but to conclude by singing a song. Oh my and God. so, no, don't worry. <laughs> I'm not that stupid. Oh, go on. So, <laughs> can you sing? Uh, uh, well, I can sing, but we have to do something else first, which is a sort of magic thing, which is to go through now into the next room where there is a large amount of wine paid for by the £9,000, so kindly uh, contributed by students for their fees. And we are now going to drink a lot of that, and the first one to have drunk most will sing. So <laughs> we are going to thank... Dorothy enormously, and incidentally, this is the first of these lectures of any kind uh, since COVID, at least that I've been able to go to, and it is so good to see everyone here and to know that you are not just Zoom avatars, which I began to think I was, and I now know that we are real human beings, and as we go on into that drinking session, our humanity will become more and more evident. 
uh, with all of its flaws. So anyway, I want to thank Dorothy enormously because she is someone who brings us practical knowledge, reflectiveness, uh, criticism, a lot to think about. Let's go on and continue the conversation uh, outside. Dorothy, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.